Just leave on two, clear take off, left hand. Take off left, it is speed one. Clear left, speed west, copy. Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. I'm PR Ganapati, your host. It is my great pleasure today to welcome Air Marshal Hemant Bhagwat. Uh, Air Marshal Bhagwat was commissioned in the administrative branch in 1981 and then retired 37 years later as the Air Officer in Charge Administration, which is the highest post in the admin branch. But uh, he's also very well known as a para jumping instructor, as somebody who pioneered low level para jumping in the armed forces. He's an accomplished uh, paratrooper, over 2000 jumps to his credit, and uh, has demonstrated the safety of jumps as low as 300 feet above ground level, which is quite unimaginable. So we're going to hear some more about that. Uh, Air Marshal Bhagwat commanded uh, the Garu Training Center. So we'd love to hear some more about that when you speak to him. He's received uh, numerous uh, awards like the PVSM and ABSM from Presidents and the Vayu Sena Medal. Uh, and after retirement, he settled uh, in Ratnagiri and there he does some social work. We'll learn about that too. But first things first, welcome, sir, to the program. Thank you so much for taking time to speak to the Blue Skies audience. Thank you and my pleasure. Wonderful, sir. You know, we start our interviews always by trying to get to know our guests better. So I'd love to hear where you grew up and what was your motivation to join the service? Did you have any family background or connections? And what was your initial journey and training like? Okay. Uh, okay. To begin with, uh, I, the place I have settled in after retirement in October 2018 is a town by name Chipur. It falls in Ratnagri district of uh, Maharashtra, western coast, basically of our country. I grew up uh, partially in this place. I did my uh, higher secondary from here. That is from the eighth standard to eleventh standard. I am a student of that old scheme, eleven plus four. And thereafter, I did my B.S. in chemistry and zoology from the same place, from Mumbai University. My college is affiliated to Mumbai University. After uh, I did my graduation, uh, I wrote the UPSC exam out of curiosity. Those days, uh, UPSC exam, I am I'm referring to actually the CDS exam. I wanted to join actually Indian Army and I was trying for the short service commission and I cleared my uh, CDS exam and I cleared my services selection board as well in the first attempt. As it happens or it happened, uh, I was declared medically unfit for uh, the short service commission by the Indian Army. So I thought ki maybe uh, uniform is not in my fate. Uh, to begin with, there is no nobody from my family who is uh, in the armed forces or who was in the armed forces. My father was a doctor. My younger brother is a doctor. And most of my family is in professions like uh, medical profession, teaching, etc. I am the first one uh, to join the armed forces. And how I joined uh, Indian Air Force is also uh, somewhat interesting. After being rejected by the Indian Army, I was doing law in Pune, in the um, ILS uh, Law College in Pune. And there I met some friends who were uh, you know, doing Air Wing NCC. All of them were C certificate holders and they were attempting uh, to join Air Force as commissioned officers. So when uh, it so happened that when they came to know that I have been rejected by the army medically, one of them su suggested, why don't you try Air Force ground duties? I said, okay, all right, uh, let me try this route as well. So I applied for uh, SSB. I mean, I was a graduate with honors. So I was entitled to apply for uh, non-technical ground duty branches in the Air Force. I applied, went to Varanasi for the Services Selection Board, got cleared. Then I was uh, no, referred to the Air Force Central Medical Establishment in Delhi for my medical. 
and there they had a big question this guy has been rejected medically by the indian army should we allow him to join uh, indian air force as a commissioned officer so for every other cadet who had come to the afcme for his medical he was cleared or not cleared within two days but i was kept there for something like uh, close to 10 working days and uh, i i was i was sent to the base hospital for the expert opinion by the orthopedic surgeon there and i was extremely physically fit so he said okay all right this guy is fit uh, and as it is he is not going to fly aeroplanes in the air force so why not uh, uh, take a chance and clear him so that guy took that bold decision generally doctors once a medical board has rejected a candidate don't overturn that decision but this decision was overturned and i was cleared medically and then that is how i joined air force in july 1984 ab initio training at air force academy dundigal wow fascinating <laughs> what was the initial training like so in how many months do you spend and what sorts of things do you learn during that time first year was uh, standard ab initio pre commissioning training for one year duration the first term is uh, no they make you walk straight they make you uh, no uh, from you come uh, you are raw from the colleges so they put you into the strides of a disciplined organization. So for first six months, it's PT, parade, physical fitness, range firing, and a bit of professional training. And uh, next term is uh, more focused towards your professional training. My branch was administration. So first term was general service uh, duty training, and the second term was devoted towards the professional training. After commissioning, I was uh, selected to join air traffic services stream of the Indian Air Force. So to join, to become eligible for that stream, you have to undergo another uh, six months long course, which I did again at uh, Air Force uh, Academy Dundigal itself for six months. And I qualified as an air traffic controller in December 1981. Aha, got it, got it. So, sir, you know, you're the first uh, admin branch officer that I've had the pleasure of interviewing. Can you tell us what all functions come under the admin branch atc of course you mentioned is one but which are the others ah okay see uh, air force works on a system of you know three streams operations maintenance and administration operations of course uh, take the priority uh, aviation is the main business of the indian air force maintenance branch will do everything to keep your equipment uh, you know serviceable whether it is aircraft whether it is radar whether your missile system whether it is your signal system and uh, no uh, giving support to both operations as well as the maintenance activities of the indian air force is the third stream that is administration administration broadly speaking looks after there are lots of departments but important ones are you no know, the security of the indian air force is the responsibility of the administration then air force is also a technical service which depends a lot on the infrastructure it is a, a no infrastructure centric service in a sense when you uh, say acquire a new system whether an aircraft or a radar or a missile system you require a lot of infrastructure to support operations and maintenance of that equipment so administration looks after in coordination with military engineering service of the indian army the infrastructure requirements uh, of the Indian Air Force. And to give you a roughly a big idea, bigger picture uh, of this uh, job or this particular aspect, average budget of the Indian Air Force on the work services alone, when at least I was AOA, was close to 2000 crores every year. Okay, that is the magnitude of the jobs or the work services that need to be done every year to give infrastructural support for operations and maintenance activities of the Indian Air Force. Then besides the work services and security, you have education, you have welfare, you have the medical services, you have the legal services, you have the you know, uh, organization, ceremonial activities which go on. To some extent, you look after also uh, the accounts uh, you know, system of branch of the Air Force. Air Force, unlike Army or the Indian Navy, has its own independent account uh, service that falls also under administration. This is the broad scope of administration. The functions are diffused, diffused everywhere at aided court level, at command level, and at operational level. This is how this three stream system works. Got it, got it. And logistics must be a major this thing also because there are so many consumables and parts and so on and so forth. 
No, it comes under technical side. Logistics is a specialist branch. It comes it comes under technical technical stream. Uh, like your uh, meteorological meteorological branch is a specialist branch. It comes under operations, air traffic services, or uh, you know, fighter controllers. They come under uh, or your air defense functions. They come under operations. Logistics comes under technical stream. Got it. Got it. So say so, you know I'm a pilot myself, uh, you know a civil pilot, and it just I remain in awe of uh, air traffic controllers and how they keep track of so many different aircraft and maintain separation and things like that. So give us some, you know, it must be even more complex in the air force where you have, uh, uh, you know, so many aircrafts of, of different types: helicopters, transports, fighters, in formation, performing. Uh, you know, not just flying straight from point to point like civil aircraft do, but doing all sorts of maneuvers. So give us some uh, sense of what that experience was like uh, being an ATC officer in the Air Force. Okay, uh, Mr. Ganpati, my experience as an air traffic uh, controller is of just seven and a half years duration. So my uh, exposure is uh, not limited, but it might have uh, you know, certain, uh, certain limitations in terms of the explaining I'm trying to do with respect to uh, air traffic services. I did a total of <laughs> 10 years. One at Jodhpur. Jodhpur is a very, very busy place. No, when I landed up in Jodhpur in December 81, it had three fighter squadrons, two MiG-23 squadrons, one uh, Marut HF-24 squadron, then one uh, Mi-8 helicopter squadron, one uh, Aeropi, that is of the Indian Army, uh, Chetak Chitas, they used to fly. And of course, there was a communication flight because Southwestern Air Command was located at Jodhpur at that time. So on an average, we have about 100 sorties uh, being launched from uh, Jodhpur airfield. So it was a very challenging job uh, because uh, uh, the uh, mix will, the Russian aircrafts will be talking in meters and kilometers. The Maruts will talk in terms of feet. The Boeing 737, which uh, Indian Airlines used to operate from there, of course, will talk in feet. And uh, the helicopters, of course, uh, are a different ball game altogether because uh, uh, their system of flying is slightly different from the fixed-wing aircrafts. And uh, but it was a very interesting time for me. Now, in my opinion, every air traffic controller uh, of the Indian Air Force, I can say, must be posted to a fighter base uh, uh, for his first posting. You learn a lot about aviation and operational aspects of the Air Force. And uh, then uh, Jodhpur was also an important node for air defense activities in that sector. So interact, you interact with those uh, agencies, radar agencies, radar controllers, and it's a very challenging and very interesting uh, game, I will call it. My subsequent postings were not as challenging. I landed up in Sulur. Sulur is down south, next to Coimbatore. And uh, when I landed up, there was not much of uh, aviation activity, but then subsequently a fighter squadron landed up there. Uh, and then, uh, of course, in uh, 87, uh, the Sri Lankan operations, the fixed wing operations uh, to some extent were launched from there. So it was quite interesting that way. My third posting was to a remote God forsaken airfield in the east called Kumbhigram. I don't know whether you have heard this about this place. It is of course, sir. <laughs> it's next to Silchar. Okay. Most of the Indian Air Force bases are uh, along the Brahmaputra Valley in the upper uh, Assam, so to say, Tejpur. You know, Jorhat, uh, you know, Dimapur, all those places are along the east west axis, no, generally north or south of Brahmaputra right. River. This uh, Kumbhigram is in Kachar district uh, in southern Assam, and uh, it's very interesting in a sense. Uh, only a couple of helicopter squadrons used to operate from there, and Indian Airlines uh, or Indian Airlines civil operations, it was a critical base because it, it's very close to Imphal, Agartala to Aizawal and to Guwahati in that sector. So I learned a lot in uh, ATC stream. A lot of situations you encounter. I've seen live ejection in Sulur. I saw, a, saw an ejection of a pilot on downwind itself. I mean, it was an Ajit aircraft. I remember his, uh, even the pilot's name, squadron leader Rane. He was the uh, flight commander of 18 squadron at that time. Uh, subsequently, he went on to become an air marshal, AOC in C and uh, uh, air officer in charge personnel highly decorated uh, professionally thorough professional he had to eject on downwind at circuit altitude so i saw that ejection in front of my eyes a couple of more ejections i you uh, know uh, had to handle but they were uh, on the radar basically uh, so at that time other ejections i was that time on the approach control but here i was on the aerodrome control the ejection happened on the downwind 
and giving immediate search and rescue was uh, naturally our responsibility and we, we I mean did it very well I mean my staff not me my staff did it rather well so this is in some total about uh, air tra traffic controlling in the Indian Air Force now since you are a civilian uh, uh, pilot I will tell you a couple of things now uh, they may interest you uh, in uh, in Air Force we have this system of controller interpreted letdown have you heard about it we call it QH uh -huh. uh, GCA waste no, 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 no. See, this is, GCA? This, is uh, this is see when on, on GCA you have that PAR approach SRE and PAR approach you are seeing the aircraft seeing the aircraft on radar okay there is one more approach uh, called uh, controlled descent okay so what happens is like say uh, in Sulur I used to do uh, this for uh, civilian I mean Indian Airlines aircraft when weather used to be marginal in Sulur I don't know what is the latest scenario now in that base there were hardly any navigational aids we, I just had one AD210 in the control tower. AD210 is a controller interpreted navigational aid. The pilot has to transmit. I it is bearing uh, or homing. I pass in the homing and then by uh, you know, heading in that direction, the pilot will reach the base uh, he is uh, trying to you know, approach. Wow. So the old pigeons. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, they used to call uh, pigeons. So in pigeons, you give distances. No, you are uh, bearing is so and so, distance so and so. In this uh, procedure, there, there is no provision to give distance. So what used to uh, what, oh no distance information. Yeah. Wow. So okay. what you do is when the clouds are low and they are below the minima of the pilot, he will ask you, okay, can you give me a controlled descent? And uh, air traffic controllers in the air force are that way uh, quite uh, I will say bold. So we'll accept. Yes, I will give you a controlled descent. What it means is. You ask the pilot to descend to a particular height, which will be, of course, uh, safety altitude to approach your airbase. He will uh, come on uh, that heading onto your airbase. Everything is undercast, so he is not seeing the ground. But the moment the aircraft comes over the beacon, uh, over that nav aid, you will get an indication. So you tell him, Ki, okay, now you are over it, say, uh, in case of example, uh, Sulur or Kumbhigram, now you are over Sulur and at a particular height. So once the aircraft has arrived over that airbase, then you send him out on a particular heading. So you tell him, Ki, okay, you steer heading so and so and you time him. And after say a particular time uh, element, you then uh, ask him to do a 180 degree turn and fly on an inbound lake in a descending manner. And that minimum descent altitude for that sector is laid down. So you don't get him below that. But generally when he is uh, in the vicinity of your threshold, he is at a position from where he can visually spot the runaway and take over. That is, uh, uh, in some uh, total controlled descent. And I have done close to 500 controlled descents as an air traffic controller. Of course, most of them were for our fighter aircrafts. Uh, this is this is of my air traffic services career. And uh, Mr. Ganpati, to be honest with you, I got a little bit bored with air traffic controlling in Kumbhigram. So I said, Ki, why not uh, you know, see other operational side uh, of the Air Force? And that is how I volunteered for becoming a parachute jump instructor. I went for that selection, got selected, cleared my medical, and then switched my stream from air traffic controller to a parachute jump instructor. Wonderful, sir. So, just can I ask you to take a step back? So, how is this? Is there a a K broadcast asking for volunteers, and then you see it, and then you uh, you 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 volunteer for that? Is that how yeah, you yeah. found out about it? And what is the selection like? Oh yeah, para jump activity. It's a it's a very very relevant question because para activity all over the world in our, all the armed forces is a voluntary activity. Voluntary activity in the sense. Nobody can force you to leave a perfectly safe aircraft. So you have to volunteer. Now, in case of Indian Air Force, uh, they uh, send a key broadcast asking for parachute uh, volunteers for this particular stream, parachute jump instructors. Now, uh, I, I, like say I entered Air Force when Army had declared me medically unfit. Similarly, I also became a PGI in a very peculiar circumstances. I would like to you know, narrate that. It will not take uh, more than two minutes. I had applied once for becoming a parachute jump instructor when I was in Jodhpur. But my uh, senior air traffic controller, we call him Satko in the Air Force, 
he discouraged me he said youngster don't break your bones unnecessarily air traffic uh, controlling is a very interesting operational branch you remain in the uh, in this operational branch so i uh, let go then uh, like i said when i went to kumbigram i got rather bored with air traffic controlling for the simple reason there were only helicopters and uh, boeing 737s to control there were no fighters in that sector so when i volunteered i was not uh, allowed to go for selection now to volunteer there is a limit uh, on your age you cannot be more than 30 years of age uh, when you volunteer for this course because uh, the course itself is of about 7 8 months long duration and it, it takes physically a lot out of you so when uh, i applied from kumbigram i was not uh, because of shortage of controllers no in the air force those days there used to be a perennial shortage of air traffic and fighter controllers so i was not allowed to join that process and i crossed my age of 30 but then i came to know that uh, somebody else from the uh, eastern air command was permitted to undergo that selection process uh, it's a different matter that he couldn't get selected when i came to know that uh, another air traffic controller has been given that uh, privilege and i have been denied because i was at a base which was uh, remote so i put in an application uh, that this has happened and this is not fair and mr ganpati indian air force is a very very fair and very just service when at air at office they came to know that this guy had applied in time he was denied an opportunity to go for this particular selection now he is beyond 30 years of age so what they did they said okay, okay we are making an exception in your case if you you go uh, undergo that selection process which is itself of 10 days duration if you get selected and cleared medically then you can join the course and that is how i landed up becoming a pgi at the age of 31 years it has happened in the history of the indian air force only once and that was in my case right what is the selection like so what do they make you do they they make you physically uh, no they they check your physical fitness and of course your mental fitness the 10 days capsule or selection per se involves lot of running lot of uh, you know pull ups sit ups physical fitness basically see in the paratroopers training school uh, you are training the uh, soldiers of the airborne regiments of the indian army and they have to not only physically psychologically accept you as their instructors so you have to be physically fit at par with them so uh, in this selection process itself they will make you run for almost between 15 to 20 kilometers and if you land up there in winters or uh, pick up summers agra is a very nasty place weather wise so you had it luckily i, I had gone there in the month of december so it was not very um, exhausting But like i mentioned earlier i was physically extremely fit at the age of 31 also i could get through very easily went to delhi again for medical for the same in, at the same establishment and uh, to my uh, surprise and luck they again cleared me for this job there is a nuance in this no in a sense i didn't tell you why i was declared medically fit unfit by the army uh, there is a condition with my spinal cord called uh, spina bifida plus sacralization of last lumbar vertebrae now i have never understood the uh, real implications of these medical terms but army says it's no go for us when i went for my pgi medical again uh, they had a, a bit of uh, you know discussion on this uh, issue they said ki look your backbone is of a particular uh, structure we don't know what will happen to you when you start doing para jump activity uh, because you, you know when you do landings you take a lot of impact and you will land up uh, on drop zones outside any everywhere but they again decided ki okay we'll take a chance because you are physically fit you have cleared the selection process so they again cleared me medically to join uh, uh, fraternity as a parachute jump instructor and i am very happy to say and proud to say that uh, i didn't let my medical fraternity down their judgment was perfect and on the same backbone i have done uh, 2400 plus jumps Uh, in my air force career fact, i did a jump just 3 days before i retired as an air marshal oh my goodness <laughs> lovely so sir um, and so what is the training like those 7 8 months yeah, yeah. what seven, eight do you months, do uh, the training is you no know, first you undergo 36 working days of toughening uh, no it called it is called physical toughening phase means from morning your working hours start in the morning at around 5:30 5:30 to 12:30. These six hours, seven hours, you are doing nothing but physical fitness for 36 days. Running, push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, you no, know, all kinds of rollings. After you uh, complete 
toughening phase there is a selection process again held in the sense ki whether you have achieved the benchmark or not so you have to do a shuttle run you have to do certain pull ups you have to do sit ups sit ups with both your you know uh, palms uh, behind your head your knees straight and you have to do 126 sit ups non stop to qualify okay because your stomach muscle have to be strong okay not very many people can do it but of course they don't expect you to do it overnight in those 36 days they will put you through the paces so you complete the toughening phase you, uh, you know reach the benchmark then you undergo yourself a basic para jump course of five jumps then you undertake advanced ground training which is again of two months duration in that all the you uh, know technical issues with respect to para training are are taught to you and then you under, undertake one uh, course as a super numerary instructor it means a qualified instructor is watching each and everything that you are doing for that particular course that is of uh, you know army training and once you uh, qualify in that phase then you are given an independent course of army paratroopers that you uh, uh, provide as an instructor for one month and that is how after 7 months if everything has gone on well and in these 7 months you have to also do lot of other jumps no uh, you do minimum 20 jumps uh, every third jump is by night then with equipment with uh, weapons with all kinds of uh, configurations and at the end of this 7 month period and after having successfully completed these jumps you get your parachute jump instructor's wing which is uh, not like a pilot's full wing half a wing like navigators or flight engineers wear on their uniform okay this is in some total uh, jump instructor's training capsule fascinating and so you know there's also a, a, a wing with a parachute in it that some people wear on the right sleeve that is you get it once you complete your five jumps or something of like that is it that is, that is an adventure uh, insignia adventure course you do it on adventure basis a lot, lot of see air force encourages a lot of aero adventure activity i mean of course air force also encourages uh, land and uh, water sports activities as well but since uh, air space is the domain of the indian air force we do encourage lot of people to do uh, para jumping as an adventure activity there is a directorate of air force adventure which has its own uh, you know uh, i was posted there as a deputy director for two years you do on adventure basis there is no night jump there is no weapon jump there is no equipment jump there is no uh, jump in a tactical sense it's all fun and adventure you take the risk all right but there is more of adventure more of fun than uh, professional dimension to it now you were saying you are um, so you're handling courses of army personnel uh, in the yeah, yeah, paratrooper yeah. training school is it yeah 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 uh, can i can i tell you something about the paratrooper training school and the system of para training Yes sir please i was going to ask you about that but also i want you to explain the different types of jumps that you mentioned i know i am familiar with static line and the other one where you pull the cord yourself but if if you can for the audience just explain the various types of parachutes types of jumps that would be very useful sir okay uh, no para trooping as an activity per se gets broadly divided into two categories first is military parachuting and other is uh, no sports parachuting now in both categories you will have static line parachuting as you mentioned and skydiving or free fall now uh, the the adventure side you have static line uh, parachuting for the uh, fun or adventure of it then in sports parachuting you do a lot of skydiving i mean what you see those guys doing relative work in the air before opening of parachute you jump from an aircraft you join with with each other at a, a particular height you move away then open your parachute that is uh, you know sports skydiving uh, then you after your op- opening of canopies you do a lot of canopy relative work now both these activities whether uh, relative work or canopy relative work uh it these activities have demonstration value and of course a lot of uh, you know from the adventure point of view it has got a lot of uh, fun and adventure but when it come to military parachuting the main thrust is on static line parachuting because ultimately airborne soldier will be dropped in the enemy territory at a very low altitude and at a very critical uh, you know uh, position in your ground operations 
so the aim is to quickly get out of the aircraft your parachute is deployed by a process called a static line deployment as you leave the aircraft the opening process of the uh, parachute starts and within two and a half seconds to four seconds maximum your parachute will be deployed and idea is to quickly discard your parachutes and move for your uh, no whatever combat mission you have been assigned so in military parachute again you have the static line parachuting which is done for all the airborne regiments uh, of the indian army and uh, for the special forces you also undertake combat military free fall combat free fall that is called and that activity uh, right up to 25 even 30000 feet above ground level you of course have to use oxygen when you go above 15000 feet so we undertake training for the army's uh, no, no paratroopers in paratroopers training school in both these dimensions for sports parachuting on a very limited uh, in a very limited manner but for military parachuting static line and skydiving is the main bread and butter for paratroop training school at agra ah got it okay and pts is a, is a very unique squadron in the entire indian air force of course air force has its own uh, fighter squadrons bomber squadrons transport squadrons heavy lift transport squadron no you have you have got your airborne radar squadrons you have your uh, air to air refueling uh, squadron but paratroopers training school is is unique in its own sense in a sense it has 12 antenna 32 aircraft like any other transport squadron but it has got two more uh, stream under the commanding officer one is called the ground training flight where the training of the indian army's paratroopers uh, happens before they go for live jump activity and there is one more section where safety equipment workers about 90 boys specially trained in packing of parachutes which are used for live jump activity on a day to day basis mm. that section looks after the critical activity of packing parachutes and also their maintenance and repair oh. they also look after the wall reserves of the indian army when you will require those parachutes to be used in operations now a parachute has shelf life and uh, you no know, uh, life in terms of jumps generally for a static line parachute it is 100 jumps and 15 years but it depends on the manufacturer so you have to look after the parachutes you have to use them for live jump and you have to also maintain uh, them for uh, the operational requirements this is broadly the configuration of the paratrooper training school as a squadron this is one of the oldest transport squadrons of the indian air force it was established to way back in 1941 uh, in delhi as a air landing school then it went to pakistan chaklala and then uh, in about 1942 i think during the second world war and then in 47 after the assets were divided between india and pakistan one element remained there and the um, other element landed up in agra along with 50 independent para brigade aha uh-huh. got it and i will tell you in addition to the routine transport flying which the squadron undertakes like any other transport squadron of the indian air force paratroopers training school on an average per month does close to 3000 live parachute jumps in all kinds of military uh, configurations mm-hmm. this is the one say about 30, 35 to 40000 jumps every year year in and year out wow. and, and these are how many paratroopers per am 32 and so and okay and n32 i mean of course uh, a paratrooper for a paratrooper what matters is uh, the platform he requires a platform to get out from the aircraft okay but uh, for a paratrooper like me n32 n32 has a special place because maximum of my jumps i have either done from n32 aircraft or from me series helicopters i mean out of my 2400 jumps close to 1500 jumps will be from an 32 aircraft it is you no know, beautifully designed aircraft for paratrooping Russian aircraft, very powerful engines, no comfort for for the paratrooper. Okay, there are wooden benches and lots of noise, lots of vibration. Uh-huh. But it's a it's a it's a very very para friendly aircraft. In a sense, uh, it carries 40 paratroopers fully loaded with combat equipment, with weapons and everything. Your uh, you know your sections load also se- drops separately. Right. And uh, the beauty the beauty is uh, the earlier aircraft like Dakota, Avro. caribou you had to when you exited aircraft you generally exited from the side door side okay but uh, with the side door so the in flight once the aircraft is at drop altitude the side door will be open and the paratrooper has to jump at 90 degrees to the line of uh, to the line of flight in a sense the aircraft is heading in a particular direction 
you exit at 90 degrees to that uh, direction of flight so it gives you a good uh, you know uh, this thing what what is called uh, a dap or twist in the air when you that blast of the aircraft engine is is slightly funny but when you go out from an an 32 aircraft you jump in the same direction i mean uh, rather 180 degree opposite direction of the flight of the aircraft the aircraft you just have to walk away from the aircraft and you are out you have taken your step out into the blue you just go out it's very smooth very maneuverable aircraft i mean the jump the lower altitude yeah. jumps we have done only from an three to aircraft other aircraft don't come uh, like that uh, yeah. so low got it got it now sir in military paratrooping uh, you know you have large numbers of people to drop in an arrow drop zone and you know you have wind and all sorts of other conditions so what does one do to ensure certain accuracy of the drop particularly at night uh, as much as you can share which is not confidential yeah see there is a there is a drop zone established training drop zone next to air, air force station agra we it, it, there is a village called malpura uh, it's about uh, five uh, odd nautical miles from agra air base and uh, it's approximately 1 by 1 km uh, piece of land flat uh, the para for the paratroopers it has a special place you know in their hearts it is called the good earth you know, the mother earth no this is where everybody learns to you uh, know uh, land uh, for the first time after you have jumped out from the aircraft now this desert surface is maintained for uh, training purposes so that there are no landing injuries or landing injuries are minimized which means the desert is plowed repeatedly and uh, in the an32 aircraft there is a navigator in addition to the pilot and co-pilot there is a navigator Uh, there is a bubble no from which you can look outside actually he sits in that bubble only you have seen that in an 32 an 26 aircraft uh, so it is the navigator of the aircraft who will give you you know the command of yellow on and green on and on green on you just go out of the aircraft and uh, i am very proud and happy to uh, say that the professional acumen or expertise of navigators in, in the indian air force is of such a high caliber that very rarely you will go out of the drop zone yes sometimes you do because of winds and factors which are beyond your control uh, but uh, i tell you mr ganpati one uh, I, i don't i hope i am not divulging any uh, uh, secret per se but indian air force navigator Uh, had that capacity earlier of course now nowadays you don't require it because technology has impacted the, the field of aviation also in a big way i am talking about what used to happen 30 years back 20 years back no you have the concept of blind drop blind drop in a sense uh, you will use uh, a piece of land uh, to do a tactical uh, you know operation para operation now the aircraft will take off from a base and navigator will take the aircraft on a tactical routing and then he will bring you over that uh, point you have selected off the map and he will drop you at night within a kilometer of the uh, point you have selected at night and there were no gps of this there i mean an 32 aircraft uh, of course nowadays uh, gps makes things so easy uh, but uh, those days to go by what is called blind reckoning no uh, the, the mental dr the dead reckoning and i have done couple of jumps at night on dead reckoning by the navigator in a tactical uh, configuration and we were within half a kilometer of the target chosen that kind of expertise indian air force navigator. and of course in free fall you choose your jumpers the spot for exiting from the aircraft is chosen by the jumper himself that is by the parachute jump instructor but that is a different ball game Can we come to your uh, experiments with low altitude jumping? So, can you tell us what is the tactical requirement? What are some of the challenges? And then, how you went about, uh, you know, gradually lowering the altitude at which you were jumping? What was that experience like? It's almost uh, describe it to us almost like we are jumping with you, so that we vicariously experience that through your eyes. <laughs> Okay. See, normal, you no know, safe altitude for uh, training paratroopers is generally 1,250 feet. Now, don't ask me why it is not 1,200 or why it is not 1,300 feet. Okay, it is 1,250 feet. It's it's there for uh, you know, donkey's ears. The the uh, this height is chosen in such a manner, like I mentioned earlier. Maximum four seconds will go by from the time of your exit from the aircraft in static line mode, 
and corresponding height loss will be about 150 to 160 feet so by about 1100 feet you are under a fully deployed canopy in case of static line parachuting that is how normal training activity is done now this is okay in peace time in uh, training configuration but for army what is relevant and for the air force also it helps because uh, lower height you fly more longer you will be under the radar of the enemy because these big birds no like an 32 or il 76 aircraft which undertake paratrooping activities at one time or the other they will be painted on the enemy's radar so in tactical scenario the idea is to fly as low as possible depending on the you know, obstacles uh, in that area and just whenever whenever you come close to your desired impact point just pop up and uh, drop the paratroopers again descend go below the radar and uh, make your you know, escape that is the general you know idea for a para operation if you have a total air superiority then there is no problem like we had uh, over the skies of uh, eastern east pakistan in 1971 uh, uh, war then you could drop at any height because you control indian air force controlled the skies over east pakistan uh, from day one of uh, the operation now coming to the height, para height indian army said okay, okay our training uh, is okay at 1250 feet but there are some parachutes in our inventory the manufacturers have claimed and that is why they were bought from uh, those sources that these parachutes can be dropped in tactical configuration as low as 300 feet above ground level but nobody has done a live jump at that low level when uh, the uh, sales the test jumper of that company came to sell this parachute to the indian army he demonstrated a jump only at 500 feet he refused to come down below 500 feet uh, so India projected a requirement let us do some live jumps at 300 feet AGL so that they will have uh, no assurance that yes this parachute can be safely jumped at 300 feet and based on this information you, do, you are planning for your operations so naturally the task came to the parachute training school so we devised a methodology in which from 1250 feet uh, we went down to first 800 feet did a lot of jumps gathered data then went to 600 feet then went to 500 feet and then ultimately went to 300 feet and uh, uh, jump is challenging because anytime you go below 600 feet you will not have an opportunity to open your reserve parachute that is that is what okay. the uh, science of paratrooping says because uh, when you jump out for first three four seconds you are allowing your main canopy to deploy once it has uh, not deployed properly then you have to go for your reserve handle which is generally situated on your front on your chest then you pull the uh, rip of your reserve handle and then you assist the reserve parachute to deploy in parachuting higher you are safer you are when you do jump below 600 or 500 feet you won't get time for your reserve to open should there be a malfunction with your main parachute so every time we went to 600 feet we notionally we carried the reserve parachute but every jumper knew that uh, there is a requirement of opening a reserve he will not have sufficient time and height to do it so for the, you know for the comfort of uh, no, because we were used to carrying a reserve parachute on your chest in static line parachuting from higher heights we carried a reserve parachute uh, just as a matter of habit below 600 feet as well and of course we planned that jump well in a sense uh, we did not uh, we said okay, okay we will not jump above eight knots of surface winds and this 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 particular parachute or this canopy has special designs which uh, ensures that even at lower altitude it will deploy it has a the net at its uh, no it is called anti inversion net at the bottom of the canopy then it has got air scoops on the canopy so they they ensure uh, the you know, rapid deployment of the canopy then there are some oxidation dampening uh, you no know, designs in that uh, nets in that parachute so generally the manufacturer has taken care from his point of view uh, to ensure that the parachute will open but paratrooping uh, is always has always been a very uh, you no know, tricky business in a sense uh, things can go wrong and when they go wrong they go wrong very quickly right, right so this is in how we went about doing those low altitude jumps fascinating and what happened uh, the data we collected was so good so reliable that now for refresher training 
with certain types of parachutes instead of 1250 feet uh, paratroopers training school as a matter of routine now undertakes uh, uh, you know, live jump activity at 800 feet uh -huh. or of course qualified paratroopers mm -hmm. basic training right right and you know that sort of altitude at 300 feet how quickly do you reach the ground uh, so it's almost like you jump and yeah i'm 65 kilo <laughs> it depends on your weight also uh, so from the time you exit the aircraft you will hit the ground between 9 to 11 seconds oh, depending oh. on your weight if you are lighter weight then you will take a slightly longer time but uh, say 70 kilo 75 kilo guy will hit in 9 seconds 9 to 10 seconds max <laughs> wow you just go out and uh, and no the the uh, the funny thing is no it's not only a, it's a very tricky as an aviator you will appreciate it better uh, an aircraft like an 32 it flies uh, at 300 feet above ground level with ramp open configuration now when your ramp is closed you can fly at uh, you know 300 feet agl with speed now for paratrooping you have to do two things you have to have your ramp open and you have to also maintain a speed of not more than 240 kilometers per hour oh. so you as an aviator as a pilot you will understand how tricky that configuration is right, right. and in paratrooping, in paratrooping what happens there are 40 paratroopers on board you give green on and suppose in a 20 guys go out when 20 guys go out 20 into 90 kilograms or 100 kilograms means 2000 kilograms weight goes out from your aircraft in less than 14 15 seconds so you have to cater for that phenomenon also as an aviator yeah so that jump was for both for jumpers as well as for the aviators also sir uh, changing topics a little bit so you know we've all been very proud of uh, the akash ganga team were you uh, involved at all or can you throw some light on what they do how they trained for it uh, yeah I, I was I was a member of Akash Ganga team in my first tenure and uh, I did a second tenure as a chief instructor at Paratroopers Training School. Uh, I was the leader of this team for five and a half years. Fascinating. Uh, I mean, uh, Akash, Ganga has, Akash Ganga has jumped all over the Indian Air Force. What we do in the PTS is every parachute jump instructor has to be a qualified freefall instructor, that is combat freefall instructor. But we choose amongst these uh, combat uh, freefall qualified instructors guys who have the flair for sports parachuting whether it is a uh, relative work in the air or canopy relative work or accurate landing uh, of your you know, canopy we have gone into stadiums like Jawaharlal Nehru stadium ambedkar stadium uh, zoo stadium zoo beach stadium uh, andri sports stadium in mumbai juhu beach i have landed in brebon stadium i mean akash ranga jumped all over the uh, country in all kinds of uh, you know, configurations and over all kinds of drop zones stadiums hockey stadiums football stadiums so you require guys with uh, good experience good canopy handling abilities good sense of uh, awareness of what is happening in the air once you have deployed your canopy you must understand how the wind are uh, you know, taking you where they are taking you where the target is and uh, an instructor which has to be uh, a notch above the routine combat free fall instructor of course combat free fall instructor also uh, takes a lot of risks because he's jumping at night with oxygen in all kinds of scenarios but uh, akash ganga of course has a lot of visibility because it has got a lot of demonstration value yeah and um, you were also then later the commandant of the garud training school so tell us about the garuds what was the reason why the air force you know established the garuds and how is there training similar to or different from any other special forces or commandos okay this is slightly longish story how i landed up as commandant of uh, garud regimental training center see at the turn of the century it so happened uh, i'm talking about you know 1998 1999 till that time indian air force did not have uh, its own uh, special forces by and large the idea was if air force required uh, any action to be taken by commandos indian army will be in a position to undertake that activities i mean whether you will uh, like i mean just to give an example suppose there is a particular radar across the border which is really bothering your operations so you might uh, like to think of uh, uh, and it is so situated that it cannot be addressed by ground to ground artillery or from the air then you might think of a commando raid just take out that radar for a certain uh, amount of time so that your air operations can be launched in that sector uh, you know, smoothly. At the turn of the century, till that uh, point, about 98-99, uh, Indian Army was willing and uh, had planned for these kind of uh, you know, uh, activities for the Indian Air Force. 
but uh, you 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 know what happened in the valley you know uh, how our western adversary is troubling us in the valley so a time came when uh, indian army maybe i don't know at that time i was at a much lower level but at air headquarter level it so happened that uh, a suggestion was uh, made to the air force as to why don't you have your own uh, special forces and indian air force is a very, very positive service no when air force realized that uh, it can uh, i mean it needs to have its own special forces what it did was it came to pts indian uh, air force because information was there that paratroopers training school on a day to day basis in a very routine manner interacts with special forces of the indian army the independent para brigade located at agra has six regiments and uh, all the besides these regiments all the special forces of the indian army uh our trainees of the paratroopers training school so parachute jump instructors interact closely with uh, special forces of the indian army so it, air headquarters gave a task to the paratroopers training school to run a pilot project can we do an in house uh, you know capsule course and have our own commandos so i was it so happened i was the chief instructor at that time in paratroopers training school so we took on the challenge i went to the indian army army has a commando school at belgao as well as a special forces training school at nahan in uh, north uh, next to ambala about 80 km from ambala so i went there i went there and uh, uh, see uh, operationally i was interacting with the commandos all the time i mean as a parachute jump instructors so informally they were very forthcoming they were very open they said we understand uh, difficulties you will face uh, when you will raise your own special forces we are there to help you and very magnanimously they share, they shared information which i wanted from them uh, whether about training pattern whether about equipment whether about weapons all that information i gathered i depended a lot on uh, their advice i came back to agra and then we selected 10 parachute jump instructors who were young two two officers and eight senior ncos i mean senior ncos means they were just sergeants and two flying officers and with this uh, core group with this core group i ran a pilot project for something like 10 months and we trained them uh, as uh, uh, air force commandos we used to uh, you know call, call them those days sarco special air commandos and then this uh, team was inspected by the command team then air headquarter team also came and inspected it when we passed the muster the indian air force chief air chief marshal tipnis flew down to agra to see what we have done and once he was satisfied yes uh, the process followed the procedures established the uh, no thinking is correct the methodology is correct he gave a go ahead for raising special forces in the indian air force that is how the garud now of course they were rechristened subsequently as garuds that is how the garud force came into being because i was instrumental in running the pilot project subsequently when i was a group captain and i had finished my higher air command in the college of air warfare at uh, hyderabad i was uh, posted as commandant of uh, garud regimental training center located at chandi nagar near bagpat okay that is how i landed up as the commandant of that place because uh, i was kind of the uh, guy who had ran that you know pilot project successfully for the indian air force so the air force was kind enough to give me the privilege of commanding that base fascinating air force i told you it's a very and that service right so these are experienced para jump instructors with additional commando training and then they also know how to disable a radar or you know um, do the air force related uh, you know disruption activities oh, fascinating okay makes a lot of sense now so so I, you know we spent almost an hour but just love to hear have you had any um, emergencies have you ever had to use your reserve parachute and if so can you describe what that was like uh, oh, I, i i had to reserve i open my reserve for on four different occasions one by night and once once at a place called thois uh, you have you must have heard about uh, our air base called thois next to day okay so we were doing an activity over uh, that thois air base and my main parachute malfunctioned and i had to open my reserve at that, that altitude high altitude but it's a part of the game all four times i could do the reserve operation in a in a, in a very you know controlled manner and land safely that that, that is that is how effective your abinisho training is i mean uh, whenever you go for a jump you will always you know rehearse the 
emergency drill in your mind. Pre-jump briefing will include emergency procedures, including opening of your reserve, what happens, what you will do, at what height you will do, and all those things are drilled into you in such a manner that you, the moment your eyes have seen that your main canopy has not deployed properly, everything automatically happens. Your hand will go for the reserve, you will first discard the main parachute in case of free fall, and then you will open your reserve parachute. On all four occasions, I could handle the emergencies well. So tell us what happened. So what, what did in the and especially at night, how can you tell that your main is not deployed? Is it just because you are not decelerating? At night, see, we do a lot of jumps at night in Agra, uh, and uh, once we were see what happens is you no know, paratrooping activity is a very well planned activity, uh, but sometimes in the uh, you no know, sortie there will be some additional space available. So you will plan your training along with you no know, the military training even at night. So once we were doing a uh, night jump. A free fall that is skydiving by night and uh, we had planned an exercise uh, before opening of parachute it went off very well and when i went for my reserve uh, uh, sorry when i went for my main parachute it, it streamed in the air all right but uh, uh, the rate of descent uh, i realized the rate of descent and the turns I, I was getting when you jump with a square canopy if the parachute has not deployed properly you will start getting turns because one side of the canopy is flying at a uh, normal speed and the side where the problem is, it will not uh, fly at the same speed. I mean, I am talking about a rammer square canopy. So, you, are, you will start getting into turns. And that day it so happened, that night it so happened, there was a cloud cover also at around 3,000 3, feet. So, I went into vicious turns after opening my main parachute. And uh, then I realized uh, the, uh, there is no point in trying to assess what because at night, like you said, you don't get to see the canopy. It's, it's dark, all, all dark. Uh, so I discarded my main parachute, fell for some more time, and then opened my reserve at around 2,500 feet. And all this is happening in a, in a, in a space of how many seconds? And... Uh, it, see, the, the procedure is such, you see the malfunction in the main canopy, then you discard your main parachute. There is a handle, when you yank that handle, the main canopy, which is not uh, no, uh, no flying properly, will get detached from you. Right. When that happens, you will again start falling under gravity. You have to maintain your position and then go for your reserve parachute. Oh, so you will start accelerating again. Uh. Uh, you, you have to yank one more handle. Right. And uh, this whole thing will happen between uh, from the time you have taken the decision to discard your main parachute to opening of your reserve parachute will happen between 4 to 6 seconds depending on the time you have taken for discarding the main and opening your reserve. Right. And you have to be continuously aware of your height. You have to monitor what at what height you are doing it. In free fall, there is no reserve opening below 2000 uh, feet above ground level, which means whatever decision you have to take, you have to take about 2000 feet above the ground. That is the law. And once you pull the reserve, how much altitude do you leave, uh, do you lose before the reserve fully deploys? Uh, it, 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 it's not more than uh, 200 feet because uh, the opening sequence of the reserve parachute is such, uh, there is a spring loaded uh, pilot chute which quickly jumps out and the opening is, uh, is designed in such a way it is very quick. It is very quick with uh, hardly any uh, loss of height. At least what happens is uh, the reserve parachute will uh, will go out from your pack tray uh, and it will immediately reduce your rate of descent that is critical you get the moment your rate of descent reduced you gain more time to handle it right, right, right. that that is how it works wonderful sir thank you so much for your conversation today it's been just wonderful to learn so much about admin branch atc and then of course para jumping and the garuds and akash ganga uh, it's really been a delight to speak to you and i want to thank you for taking the time Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Ganpati. Pleasure was mine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, folks, that's all we have time for this week. Join us again next week. In the meantime, sign up for updates at blueskiespodcast.com. There you'll find links to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can also write to us with your comments, questions, suggestions and feedback from the website or to blueskies at prganapati.com. 
Subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting platform such as Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and even on YouTube. If you like what you heard, share it with your friends, give us a rating in your favorite podcasting app, and write us a review. It will help other people find us. I want to give my thanks to Saurav Chaudhia for our logo and Prithvik for the music. I want to reiterate that all the views expressed here are personal and this podcast has not been approved by or reviewed by the Air Force, Ministry of Defense or any branch of the government. In the meantime, stay safe and Jai Hind.